Dear friends from Athens, dear Manos y Manos, I would like to thank you very much for inviting me to the Athens Shoulder Course. I'm terribly sorry that I cannot be with you in person this year, but nonetheless I'm glad that I'm invited to give a talk about shoulder pacemaker treatment for functional posterior shoulder instability. To begin with, I would like to declare a um, conflict of interest. To explain the concept of functional shoulder instability, I would like to show you a case that I have seen many years ago. You can see this young girl and she has a severe scapular dyskinesis and subsequently also a posterior shoulder instability. Back in the day, a former teacher of mine performed a huge iliac crest bone graft in order to stabilize her shoulder joint. Unfortunately, the surgery did not lead to the desired stabilization effect. However, what was amazing to see is that before the surgery, under anesthesia, the patient did not have a posterior shoulder instability anymore and the muscle activation pattern and scapular kinetics seemed to be quite normal. Almost 100 years ago, Sir Arthur Blunder Bankart published his very famous work on the anterior capsular labor repair, nowadays called the Bankart Repair. If you continue to read in his work published in the British Medical Journal, you will find the following sentence. I've seen one case of posterior recurrent dislocation. That case was in a woman and she was not operated upon. The condition has been attributed to abnormal laxity of the capsule of the joint and to weakness of the surrounding muscles. So it's quite amazing to see that Sir Arthur Blunder Bankart almost 100 years ago already recognized functional shoulder instability. Sometimes in clinical practice you see patients that are able to dislocate the shoulders during every elevation of the arm. You can see on the fluoroscopic images that there is a severe posterior instability every time the shoulder is raised and at the same time you can see on the MRI that there is no structural defect that actually causes this instability. I like to call this type of shoulder instability functional shoulder instability as opposed to structural shoulder instability. As in these particular cases, the instability is not caused by structural defects but rather by pathological muscle activation patterns. In posterior shoulder instability, it's hyperactivity of the latissimus dorsi and hypoactivity of the infraspinatus. Now, who is affected by this condition? We saw that 0.5 to 2.6% of our medical students are able to dislocate the shoulder if they want to. And so it seems to be quite frequent among a young patient population. The age of onset is typically around 11 to 15 years. Patients are characterized by loss of shoulder function, discomfort, chronic pain and stigmatization if they have a non-controllable condition. Physiotherapy and surgical treatment are considered potential treatment options. However, they are associated with uncertain outcome. Sometimes physiotherapy just does not work. And in the case of surgical interventions, sometimes the outcome can be even worse with progressive pain and early degenerative changes. And this is why we believed that an alternative treatment was much needed. We developed the so-called shoulder pacemaker treatment, which is a motion-activated electrical muscle stimulator that allows to stimulate the previously hyperactive muscles during certain motion patterns. And you can see in this particular case how this shoulder pacemaker is able to stabilize the shoulder of this patient with a very severe type of functional posterior shoulder instability. We call this treatment a feed-forward treatment as it is teaching the patient how to activate the previously hypoactive muscles. We come back to the example that I already showed you of the young girl who has a severe type of functional posterior shoulder instability and then I would like to share some treatment slides with you. You can see how this patient performs regular physiotherapeutic exercises and while she does so, the shoulder pacemaker activates her hypoactive muscle groups and you can follow this progress on an app. 
The motion activated simulator is dynamic, so you can even use it while you're doing very functional exercises, as for example a tennis swing in this particular patient who won wanted to return to her favorite sports, which is tennis. You can see the six weeks outcome for this particular patient, how she regained a nice range of motion and she was able to return to her typical sports. Here you see some more examples of a patient that has a functional posterior shoulder instability. She was a circus artist, so obviously she could not continue with her profession. And what you can see is the one week result after the first training sessions. You can see how she can move her arms very nicely and she now has a stable shoulder joint that allows her to perform her profession again. Another example is this young volleyball player suffering from functional posterior shoulder instability, as you can clearly see in the clinical and fluoroscopy images. You can see the outcome after a four week treatment course after previously unsuccessful conservative treatment in terms of conventional physiotherapeutic exercises. You can see that after the shoulder pacemaker treatment, she was able to return to her sports. This is a case that was treated conservatively and later on with an arthroscopic posterior capsular labral shift at our department. And unfortunately, it did not help this patient as he continued to suffer from posterior shoulder instability. Down the road, we developed the shoulder pacemaker treatment concept and we tried it in this patient. And what I'm going to show you is the six weeks outcome after the treatment. So you can see this young patient was able to return to his martial arts and he was ab even able to do jumping push-ups despite previously unsuccessful conservative and surgical interventions six weeks after the beginning with the shoulder pacemaker treatment. We obviously wanted to examine our results in a more scientific way and so we conducted a prospective cohort study of 24 cases of patients with previously failed conventional physiotherapy. What we saw is that we could improve significantly the outcome of these patients quite rapidly. Even though there was a quite large standard deviation, so we had great patients and patients who were not just as great, we were able to obtain stability in these cases with only little numbers of recurrence. Interestingly enough, these patients were still able to perform a deliberate controllable dislocation, but if they did not want to, the shoulder remained stable. And this is an important difference. We obviously analyzed what factors lead to a better outcome and which ones don't. And what we saw is that the best effect is seen in young non-obese athletic patients with unilateral affection. We saw less effect durability with structural problems as for example increased retroversion, posterior decentering and congenital glenoidal dysplasia. As we all know that every time in orthopedic surgery there is a new invention, you will also likely find a case series that is showing that the new technique is working just great and leading to great outcomes. As we are also subject obviously to this confirmation bias. We set out to perform a nationwide randomized controlled trial with international independent study supervision in order to evaluate scientifically in a more thorough manner the efficacy of the shoulder pacemaker. We included patients with functional posterior shoulder instability and we randomized them to receive either conventional physiotherapy, which is the gold standard, versus the gold standard plus simultaneous shoulder pacemaker treatment. As already mentioned, there was independent study supervision, so the data was collected outside of Germany in Switzerland by Laurent Odiger and his team, and he performed independent data monitoring and analysis. Moreover, we had an independent international expert group who was supervising the study, namely Giuseppe Porcellini, Simon Lambert and Pascal Boileau. I will share with you preliminary unpublished data of this randomized controlled trial what we can see is that the shoulder pacemaker leads to a significantly better VOSI score, which is the main outcome measurement. And if the patients did not do well with physiotherapy and opted to cross over into the shoulder pacemaker treatment arm, we can see that 
they, these patients still have the same nice effect of the shoulder pacemaker that their peers had that started primarily with the shoulder pacemaker treatment. So to conclude, we can claim that functional posterior shoulder instability is more common than expected and it results in severe instability despite hardly any structural defects visible on MRI and CT scans. We also know that surgery in these kind of patients should be avoided as long as possible and it should only be a last resort in case of persistent instability despite adequate conventional physiotherapeutic or advanced physiotherapeutic treatment. What we saw in our trials is that functional posterior shoulder instability can be treated more effectively using a shoulder pacemaker enhanced physiotherapy than with conventional physiotherapy alone. So thank you very much for letting me share these exciting new developments in the field of posterior shoulder instability and I hope to see you soon. Bye bye.